Good evening and welcome to Primetime News. I'm Sandro Fernando and here are your headlines for tonight. UNHRC resolution on Sri Lanka adopted without a vote. Is the proposed oil refinery in Hambantota another Volkswagen-style investment? MP Gammanpilla demands an explanation from Minister of Justice on claims the documents required for Mahindran's extradition were not sent to Singapore. Minister Ravi Karna Nayaka complains to the CID on spread of false news on power outages. First up in news, resolution L1 title Promoting Reconciliation, Accountability and Human Rights in Sri Lanka was adopted at the 40th session of the United Nations Human Rights Council a short while ago. The resolution, presented by a co-group including the United Kingdom and co-sponsored by Sri Lanka, was passed without a vote. The resolution, titled Resolution L1, is an extension of the resolution passed on Sri Lanka in 2015 citing promotion of reconciliation, accountability and human rights. This resolution, brought forward by a core group led by Great Britain and co-sponsored by Sri Lanka, grants Sri Lanka a two-year extension to fulfill the commitments made in 2015. While a number of efforts taken by Sri Lanka in fulfilling their commitments were commended, Sri Lanka were urged to fulfill their remaining obligations on a time-bound basis. I have the honour to introduce draft resolution L1 entitled Promoting Reconciliation, Accountability and Human Rights in Sri Lanka. The resolution acknowledged some very real achievements against these commitments over the last two years. It also recognizes that in a number of important areas, implementation remains work in progress. The resolution encourages Sri Lanka to accelerate its efforts to achieve full implementation of the 2015 undertakings and to set out a time-bound implementation plan to help it to make progress. It requests OHCHR to continue to strengthen its engagement with Sri Lanka and requests annual reporting by the Office of the High Commissioner for a further two years. The main sponsors of this resolution warmly welcome Sri Lanka's co-sponsorship of the draft resolution and its public affirmation that it remains determined to deliver on the commitments it has already made to this body. As partners and friends of Sri Lanka, we stand ready to support Sri Lanka as it does so. We hope that this draft can be adopted with the support of all members of this council. Minister of Foreign Affairs Tilak Marapana called for more cooperation between the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and local agencies while thanking the council for their support. Mr. President, the government of Sri Lanka considers resolution 40 slash L1 mandating an extension of two years until March 2021 to make further progress on human rights, reconciliation and accountability as a mark of recognition of Sri Lanka's political commitment and the progressive steps already taken by the government since 2015. Sri Lanka's open and constructive approach towards the work of this Council is well acknowledged. We have engaged with all seven core treaty bodies, the UPR, and have also facilitated eight visits by special procedures, mandate holders and independent experts resulting in a total of over 1,000 recommendations for expeditious implementation by Sri Lanka. Mr. President, as I put on record before this Council yesterday, we have to set our priorities right and we are committed to find innovative and pragmatic solutions to protect the country's national interest and the well-being of all Sri Lankans alike guided by the provisions of the supreme law of the land, the constitution, Sri Lanka's co-sponsorship of this year's resolution assures to all concerned persons, the Sri Lankan society at large, and to all our inter interlocutors outside the country, that we will continue to move forward within these parameters to ensure eventual closure. Mr. President, we welcome the assistance and the cooperation we have received from partners as required and invite the OHCHR to engage closely with the relevant local institutions and independent bodies, including the National Human Rights Commission, in verifying facts on ground, which will help OHCHR to provide more objective and realistic assessment on the progress made in Sri Lanka and on its genuine challenges to this Council next year. In conclusion, Mr. President, 
Sri Lanka takes this opportunity to appreciate the efforts of the members of the core group and th thank all members of this council for supporting a consensus outcome today. Now speaking about the resolution on Sri Lanka, international analyst Mohan Samarnayaka and UPFA parliamentarian Dinesh Kunavodhan expressed these views. The United States of America are at the forefront of this resolution. The countries that are supporting this resolution like Britain, Germany, France and Canada have tainted human rights records. Their history has been written in blood and the bones and remains of the indigenous people of those lands. Even if you take the present day, the situation has not gotten better, but it has worsened. The United States had led almost all of the unjustifiable wars in the world. One of the main wars is the invasion of Iraq in 2003. About one million people have died in Iraq since the war in the country began. A majority of the victims who lost their lives are civilians. Don't these people have human rights? Weren't their human rights violated? There is a ruthless war ongoing in Yemen. This war is being coordinated by Saudi Arabia. All the weapons and arms that Saudi need are being supplied by America, Britain, Australia, Canada, Germany and France. These are the human rights records of these countries. Afghanistan was invaded. Iraq was invaded. The government in Libya was destroyed and their leader was murdered on the streets. After that they started a war in Syria and got involved in that. All of these wars were headed by America and the countries in the American camp, including member countries of NATO. Britain is the country accused of killing the highest number of people. Belgium is also on this camp. Belgium's economy was built on the exploitation of slaves brought down from South Africa. So it is these kind of countries that level allegations of human rights violations against our country who won a war against separatists. The United States of America uses human rights as a weapon to establish their power in countries across the world. Exactly, the fig especially the figures that have been exposed by Lord Nesby is very clear that the Secretary General's uh, report so validity uh, does not stand because her figures are wrong. Now, she had read a report. Uh, about Sri Lanka, which had been, it had been exposed by our uh, delegation. Some of the figures are very old figures uh, in relation to many matters. So the Secretary General has been fed by interested parties, especially in relation to MANA, MANA uh, excavation of the skeletons. Secretary General seems to be going on the original complaint of the TNA. So she is becoming a TNA spokesman. She should have double checked 24 hours before whether she was coming up with the correct report, correct, correct figures. I mean, at least in relation to the figures being given, which has been um, reported in all your newspapers, uh, which we all ap appreciate. Uh, scientific knowledge cannot be rejected. And that is the main thing. And uh, Secretary General goes on the basis. Uh, luckily, uh, the report was out uh, before uh, her submission of her report. Volkswagen assembly plant in Kuliapitiya, Google balloons airborne to provide the country with free Wi-Fi, tallest standing structure in Asia to be constructed at Chalmers Granary, today oil refinery in Hambantota in collaboration with Oman's Ministry of Oil and Gas. Oman says no preparations to invest in Sri Lanka. Those were a few projects that this government pro uh, promised in the past to the general public and up to date those projects have not come to fruition or become reality. Now we have identified yet another situation that comes up to a situation like this but before we go there let me explain to you what I'm going to talk to you about. I also have uh, Mr. Farah Shaupatali joining us in the studio. Farah, let's explain to the general public as to what we are going to talk talk to them about. On the 24th of this month, which is the coming Sunday, we are going to see uh, two projects being inaugurated by the government. One is for an oil refinery project in the Mirijjavile area and the other one is also for a cement factory in the same area. Our producers can uh, show you the visuals of uh, this area as well. This is a project carried out by the BOI. Now, especially when you take a look at this oil refinery project, we are going to talk to you about 
the findings that we at News First have been able to find with regard to this oil refinery. For us, can you explain to me uh, what is happening with regard to this oil refinery? Yes, well, we, we found out that uh, these uh, two companies, basically, or two um, stakeholders, and one was the uh, a Singaporean company called uh, Silver, Silver, Park. Silver Park. They had 69.97 percent of the shares according to our research and the Oman Ministry of Oil would have 30.03 um, bringing it to a total of 100 percent but there's a problem isn't there definitely for us now when we say Oman Oil Ministry has 30 percent and uh, 0 0.03 as well yeah. with regard to this particular project this particular article came up on Reuters yesterday. This says Oman denies it has agreed to invest in Sri Lanka oil refinery project. Now is this another Volkswagen that is being promised to the general public? Because we remember what happened in that particular incident. We remember what happened at the incident where the government promised the tallest building in South Asia to be constructed. Is this something similar when Oman says 30%, the way the government says 30%, is uh, involved with regard to the Oman oil ministry and Oman denies it according to Reuters. Now, that is where for us when we decided to dig in deep into this situation and look into what has actually happened. Now, I have details with me for us to say the company that you mentioned, the Singaporean company Silver Park, which owns, which is going to own at least 69.97% what they have come across. This is their website for us, mm -hmm. uh, for our general public as well. And as you can see, it doesn't look like a very professionally put together website. It looks like something that has been uh, put together in uh, as in a bit know, of a hurry. In a bit in of a hurry, absolutely. Hurry. Now, when you go down further, you find the two founders of these companies. Yeah. One gentleman is uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Rakshan, uh, is his name. Yeah. And if you just do a simple Google search on this individual, we have this individual's history. Yes. And it doesn't look so clean for us to be playing with you. Yes. Uh, there are several controversies where this uh, particular gentleman is involved in, and yes. you can see it on several media sites as well. I'm just going to show you uh, this page on Wikipedia where everything is summed up. A mul uh, multifold increase in personal wealth is his first allegation, coal mining scam allegations. And, and I think you have to uh, notice it here. It says here, that this, this increase in wealth from 5 crores in 2009 to 70 crores in 2011 is the highest percentage rise for property amongst all ministers in the central cabinet of India. Absolutely, Faraz. Now, also, we, when we go back to this particular company and have a look at where this company is situation, uh, before we go there, we also remember yesterday we reported on a news bulletin about Mr. Nirav Modi, who mm. is a person wanted by the Indian government for fraud, who That's was right. arrested in London and is due to be extradited from London to India based on the request of the uh, Indian, Indian government. police. Whereas we here in Sri Lanka are trying to get Mr. Arjuna Mahendran. Uh, the former governor of the central bank extradited to Sri Lanka. We have more coming up on that as well. But before we get there, these people seem to be of similar stature. Indian uh, businessmen uh, mired in uh, controversy. Indeed. Uh, we see people like that coming and investing in funds here in Sri Lanka, in projects here in Sri Lanka. Now, if you just look at for us the company that is mentioned, uh, Silver Sparks, if you just look at their uh, vicinity through Google Maps. That's right. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't augur, uh, it doesn't certainly give the impression that this is a company that's investing, uh, you, what's it, 3.85 billion dollars, American dollars. That's 3,850 million United States dollars. It just doesn't augur well. Uh, we see a cafeteria here, a cafeteria. pharmacy. Uh, several other shops here and this is the building supposedly housing this particular company it as just well. seems it does seem uh, sort of inconsistent with one would expect from a company from a corporate that's going to embark on a 3850 million US dollar that's, project that's not all for us now if you take a look at when this uh, boi proposal has come in it has come in to the country in 2016 November 10th, it has come, the proposal has come forward on the 10th of November, November 2016. 2016. Yeah. But this particular company 
has been incorporated in 2070, one year after the project proposal. Indeed. This is not the only time uh, something like this has happened. No, this, this sort of trend, if you like, <coughs> sorry, uh, has happened before. Do you remember when, Chatter? I think the outer circular highway project uh, for us. <coughs> That's right. If we remember rightly, that outer circular project was concluded, the cabinet authority was given on a weekend. On a weekend. The similar, the, the trend has been set. It's, it's a bit like the, the dates trend. are a bit messed up. Yes, the dates are messed up. It means very clearly that they have been planning this scam, because that's what it appears to be, this sort of scam. They've been planning it long before. They've been planning it well before the 10th of November 2016, which is when they actually made a request of the BOI. Absolutely, Faraz. Now, when you take a look at the Singapore company, we also looked at where our local agent with regard to this particular 3.85 billion US dollar project is deciding, and we found some interesting footage. We are seeing this right uh, here on your screen. The local agent for this particular company has an address in Malwata Road in Colombo 11. For those of you who are not familiar with Malwata Road, the Malwata Road is familiar or famous for its uh, shops containing uh, CDs, cassettes and even shoes, but definitely not a 3.85 billion USD project and a local agent to have a shop there. And the address mentioned in the project proposal that we obtained from the BOI through our sources is not anywhere in Malwata Street and the address ends at number 88. We looked very thoroughly with regard to this, but the address cannot be found. If at all, if the address is available, that is located in Malwata, Colombo 11 for us. Yes, I think uh, the, the scam is sort of unraveling in bits and pieces. Uh, thanks to the uh, intense efforts of the media, who are obviously uh, representing the people's interest. Because it has been one scam after another. Uh, that, that's all I can say. Yes, Farah. Now, as you mentioned, we uh, mentioned uh, Mr. Mahendran <coughs> earlier as well. Now, with things like this happening, one can question these large amounts of money coming into the country in the form of investments. Is are these money black money? Maybe some people want to make it clean, launder it through by investing it in projects like this. That is a question that is uh, actually uh, that comes to the minds of the people. Well, who are watching it, this. well it does because uh, in this day and age, and with uh, all these uh, FIU units all over the world, it has become increasingly difficult to hide money and to shift large sums of money around the world. And one easy way would be to invest in so-called so -called projects. Faraz, Faraz uh, this uh, topic was uh, discussed in Parliament as well. Several uh, parliamentarians raised this question from the Prime Minister himself with regard to this oil refinery project. Let's hear what the Prime Minister has to say in Parliament. The other day it was said that approval had been granted for a deal between a certain company and Oman to the tune of $3.08 billion. Now who are you trying to deceive? While the government of Oman is not even aware of such an investment, if someone is trying to deceive the people of this country and award this 400 acre land to a private company, there is a massive issue there. When I spoke to the Director General a short while ago, he said that he will issue a media release and inform the people on the details.
The Prime Minister in Parliament says uh, if they want 40, we can discuss it. So, looks like it for us that this is still in the discussion stage. Well, it, it's uh, the proper way of describing it would be that this is a half-baked project. The Prime Minister, this is not some fish market and an auction of fish. Because the Prime Minister is saying, oh, well, they only had a discussion of 30 percent. But, you know, if they want it, I'll give them 40 percent. What kind of rubbish is this business? He's dealing with another sovereign state. Plus, we've seen things like this in the past. When it comes to the ETI-EAP uh, agreement, where one company came forward before the agreement, before the cabinet approval, then thereafter the company changed into something else. That's we right. have seen this happening in the country. And this same prime minister was the person who uh, said that Mahendran had gone for a wedding and that he would return. This same prime minister is the prime minister who, when we inquired, when Volkswagen uh, in spoke to us and said, we are not investing in your country, this same prime minister said, if you had asked me, I would have told you that it was not Volkswagen. So this is the same prime minister that is saying, this in also in Parliament for us. And if you notice, uh, this is the same Prime Minister who becomes very flippant when he's cornered and he's asked very specific questions. It's like the 30% from the government of Oman. And he turns it all around and becomes very flippant and then says, well, if they want to, I'll give you 40%. What, what, what is all this business? This is a complete and utter departure from due process and this has been the trend right from the beginning of the Mr. Vikramasinghe's tenure in this government, the so-called good governance team. For it started, of course, on, in February 2015 along with the bond scam. Absolutely, Faraz. Now, uh, we have been speaking about the bond scam and extraditing Mr. Arjuna Mahendran uh, back to the country to face uh, legal charges here. State Minister Sujiva Sena Singer was questioned regarding this same topic today. And Sujiva Sena Singer, State Minister, had this to say. Mahalankuye Vanchal Sambandhi Singapore in Dikita Illima Kalla Tino Da Rajayak Pidhiyata Mahu Apita Labad Innu Mahu Apita Hoyala Dinne Kira Tadugan. Man Dhanne Rajayak Vashen Idhri Patkala Tino Dhanne 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 Illima Karanna Hadisya Kattne Rajayat Apita Hitu Nitu Nukattit Dhanne 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 Illima Karanna Bari Dhikala Hanne Raja Tantri Kovari Mami 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 I don't know. We may have put in a request or maybe we have not. With regard to this issue, if there is a request from courts, we can bring him down through Interpol. Even the case has not been filed as yet. That is the true story. You are using this to attack us politically. When we sat on the COPE committee, mud was slung at us. We added footnotes in the report. All the footnotes are correct. That is why we said this was legal. The CID still cannot file a case, but they are looking for people. <laughs> It's not the lack of information. That is the mistake. The legal aspect of this matter is a separate issue that should be debated. A case hasn't been filed as yet. We are questioned on this without even a case being filed on the matter. While State Minister Sujiva Senasinghe had that to say a short while ago, we reported on a breaking news telecast. This was the letter issued by the President's Media Division uh, listing out the action that has been taken to present legal documents to the Singaporean government through the Secretary of the Defence Ministry to extradite Mr. Arjuna Mahendran, the former Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Faraz? Well, when we read uh, President Sirisena's latest uh, release on this matter, it has become abundantly clear that the integrity of Singapore seems to have taken a rather steep nosedive. We had that legendary statesperson, Lee Kuan Yew, who was a visionary and who had all sorts of wonderful ideas and who built Singapore. But today, when we see th this sort of behavior, it certainly it certainly is obvious that Singapore's integrity has taken a rather steep nose down. Absolutely, Faraz. Drawing your attention back to what Mr. Senasinghe said today, 
Sana Singh has said cases have not been filed, which is actually true. CID has not been able to file a case with regard to uh, the central bank bonds. I, I, I'm not so sure, uh, Chaturanga, that you should be saying that the CID has not been able to. I think it's better to say that the CID have not filed a case. Absolutely. And, and the question, therefore, must remain as to why. Why is this so-called I don't care attitude? Why are they not doing it? Who is behind that? We remember Faraz, the president uh, pointing the presidential commission into the bond scam. The presidential bond scam, uh, presidential commission bond scam report was sent to the AG. But what happened to it is that the president's secretary, Mr. Austin Fernando, decided to put it in the archive for 30 years. Uh, some said parts of it was available. Some said the whole thing is in the archive. But up to date, action has not been taken on the presidential uh, commission bond report. And even the forensic audit that has been uh, uh, asked for. Uh, requested in the presidential uh, commission report has not yet been done. There are delays pertaining to that, uh, as, that as well as we reported to you yesterday. And what happened to Mr. Austin Fernando? He received a promotion and he has received... He the, is now a diplomat. A diplomatic Representing uh, position. Representing his country after having tried his best to archive a report for 30 years when it was described as the largest ever fraud perpetrated on the people of Sri Lanka post-independence. It's very simple for us. Uh, if you just read this uh, media release sent out by the President's media release, it's very clear as to what steps have been taken to extradite uh, Mr. Arjuna Mahindran back to the country. And there is another simple uh, step that can be taken, and that is to, as State Minister Sujiva Sena Singh says, file a case and extradite Mr. Arjuna Mahindran. This same topic was discussed in Parliament today. Let's have a listen. <laughs> Maitri Pala Sirisena is not just a parliamentarian. He had made a public statement that he had requested for Arjun Mahendran to be extradited to Sri Lanka. Now the Singaporean government says that no proper request has been made and no sufficient documents have been provided for the extradition of Mahendran. Now what do you have to say? I think you must provide answers to this to parliament as a government. The people are watching to determine who is right and who is wrong on this matter. The president also has the right to reveal the names of any individual who obstructs these proceedings. Regarding the request made by President Maithripala Sirisena to the Singaporean government for the extradition of Arjuna Mahindran and the Singaporean Foreign Ministry's response on the matter, President Sirisena had even made a personal request to the Singaporean Prime Minister regarding the extradition of Mahindran to Sri Lanka. These actions reveal that the President has taken all the necessary steps from his side. We also expect the President to further explain these steps in detail in the near future. I requested MP Harsha De Silva to answer the question I raised. However, the response came from the opposition and not the ruling party. I submit the paper article of the Singaporean ASP newspaper and will include the article in this handout. Sri Lanka request to return Mahendran lacked certain information required under Singapore's extradition laws. Singapore has not yet received the requested supporting information and documents. I submit this to the handout. After holding discussions with the Singaporean Prime Minister, President Sirisena instructed several ministers to prepare the requested documents and to proceed with this matter. The Ministry of Justice is responsible for this extradition law to be enforced. If so, why was the law not enforced by the Ministry of Justice Talatatu Kurala? There is a court order to capture him through Interpol. However, the statement issued by the government of Singapore reveals that they were not aware of such an order. Even if Minister Talatatu Kurala does not have any connections with Arjuna Loshis, there are several parliamentarians in this government who are very close friends of Arjuna Loshis. This will have an impact on Minister Talatatu Kurala. This is a dangerous situation. The danger is that an individual such as Mahindran has left the country. Minister Talatatu Kurala must inform Parliament as to who is obstructing her from informing the Singaporean government in this regard. <laughs> We only have uh, this to say at the end. If these are the p type of people who come and invest in the country with these sorts of uh, corruption allegations, fraud allegations against them, and if these people are brought into the country, be it a court, be it silver pack, if these people are brought to the country by people like Mangaleapa, who are also involved in uh, uh, corruption charges, the country remembers what they have done. Do these people who continue to... Uh, 
how do I say this for us? Basically, not care about the people of this well, country. I, I, think, I think we need to end by posing the question. Does the government think, or parts of the government, do they think that the people are deaf, dumb, or stupid? That's the question. Definitely. It's back to the main studio. Country first. Now, alarm bells have started ringing once again with the announcement made by Prime Minister Rani Vikramasinghe on the re-entry of the EPF to the Colombo Stock Exchange. We are looking at the EPF entering the share market, which you have been requesting. They have to put into place a new security system. And as the governor has briefed me, it has progressed very, very well. So I think uh, a day will come when you see them enter the market. Many of you are saying hopefully tomorrow, but I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow. But nevertheless, let's hope it's going to happen. Here's what the concerns are about. It was Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe her who insisted that the central bank puts an end to so-called private placements and commences an auction-based system. Needless to say, it was this decision that led to the largest financial fraud in the history of Sri Lanka, the central bank bond scam. Against such a backdrop, the Premier is now suggesting that the Employees Provident Fund returns to the Colombo Stock Exchange. It must be noted that the EPF still remains the largest liquid fund available in the country. It is common knowledge that the EPF funds do not belong to the government, but the people to fund their retirement after years of hard and dedicated work. The Presidential Commission of Inquiry noted that the governor of the central bank, Arjuna Mahindran, had acted mala fide and in the interest of Perpetual Treasuries Limited, a company connected to his the Commission also noted that it would have been better had the Prime Minister sought independent counsel as to what happened on the 27th of February 2015. Instead, the Prime Minister relied on the briefing note and assurance of Arjuna Mahindran and of Deputy Governor Mr. P. Samarasiri. The Commission further pointed out that these assurances were patently misleading. In short, the Prime Minister's intransigence and unexplained support of a long-standing friend in the form of Arjuna Mahindran cost the people of this country an estimated 1,000 million loss. The alarm bells are ringing patently because the EPF is estimated to have lost in excess of 8,500 million rupees. This estimate was made by the Presidential Commission of Inquiry who asked for a forensic audit. Although four years have passed, and over 15 months had gone by since the publishing of that report, various mechanisms have been used to frustrate the investigation and accountability process of this fraud. These frustrations include an attempt by Austin Fernando, the then presidential secretary who sent the commission's report to the National Archive. Observers of the economy and good governance have pointed out that the Prime Minister is attempting to force the EPF onto the stock market without first coming to a legal conclusion to the events that led to the bond scam happening and in the process costing the People's Fund, the EPF, over 8,500 million rupees. It is in this light that in both dark and hazy, people will question the wisdom of investing their monies onto the stock market where years after the pumping and dumping scandal where absolutely zero action has been taken for that scam. Yeah, we will take the issue. We have openly said that this is not the correct issue that the PPA fund should not be touched for, for their deals. These are deals. I mean, we see the stock market today going up to, say, 100 rupees share going up to 250 floated by some company. They sell the shares. Next day it collapses. It collapses to 80 rupees. So do you want EPF funds to behave like that? No. Yeah, EPF funds should not be, should not be used in such uh, deals. I mean, it should have a very clear curve, a graph that brings return because millions of people are involved. And it is a guarantee, the biggest bank, biggest bank I mean, that gives a security to the government. Even un un unutilized, it's a bank, it's a security for the financial 
uh, sector. And with that, we wrap up news for tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. Do take care and good night.